traffic helicopter 143 Alpha Papa is departing the pattern. Leaving to the altitude. Northwest. At 5,700. We got this uh, this pretty machine right here, and with its pretty owner. <laughs> this is Brian. This is RV7. RV7. Just, just RV7A is with the tricycle gear, correct? That's correct. Okay. And how long have you had this plane in your possession? I started building this aircraft back in May of 2006. Okay. Um, started a uh, empennage kit, which is the tail section. I was living briefly in Atlanta and finished the tail section down there and brought it back. Um, so basically the early part of 06, I was introduced to this while managing a small private airport uh, north of Atlanta in the backwoods of North Georgia. And um, I was uh, kind of intrigued by them and I, I saw a gentleman who was, he's a professional builder um, doing builder assist and, and his own aircraft. And, um, just kind of got latched onto it and hooked and, and started the process back then. So so what made you, let's walk around on this right side, because this aircraft's probably the prettiest RV I've seen since the hands of time. And you chose this color, you chose this layout. What, what was the reasoning behind an RV? What, what drew you to this? aircraft so anybody who knows rvs understands the utility you get from an rv the speed uh, both at the top end and the bottom end they're incredibly efficient um, you can fly them upwards of a thousand miles without stopping if you've got your settings right um, they're 200 plus mile an hour aircraft yet they stall at you know around 50 and so they're the wing profile on this aircraft uh, from a loading perspective is an incredibly efficient wing and um, probably one of the most uh, beneficial aspects of building an RV is the RV community. Thousands of people, I think there's approaching 12,000 RVs flying. And so there is a plethora of knowledge, experience, questions you can ask. Um, there are so many resources available for the RVs. It's, uh, it's not that way if you pick up a, a plan-built aircraft. And so, so, I mean, you essentially built this plane from ground up. Yeah, I mean, certainly it comes as a kit. Yeah. And uh, the materials are, are essentially raw materials. Um, the RV-7 is a pre-punched kit. Um, and what that means is about 95% of the holes are already pre-drilled at the factory. However, um, they are about a 60 fourth of an inch too small, and that's specifically to require you to put it together and assemble it re-drill everything to the correct hole size, take it apart, dimple it, deeper it, prepare it, prime it if you'd like, and then reassemble it. So you end up taking it apart and putting it together three, four, five times throughout its life for each of the different components. So it's something that, um, it, it is very modular in design and there's a process with it. Um, it still takes a significant amount of judgment and you know you, you have to kind of think what's going on in the process early on when you're building the tail it's it's relatively simple you just follow the step-by-step -step instructions as you move forward in the kit and later on they start to do less and less hand holding 
and it's more of you need to look through the plans, you need to understand systems, you need to understand how things interact with one another. And that's probably one of the hardest things to do is to build an aircraft. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's where following other builders with build logs online, reading as much as you can, asking questions, going to uh, sport workshops, sport air workshops, things like that, where it can provide a tremendous amount of uh, additional information and, and knowledge in the process. How many hours do you think you have into this plane? Uh, in this I have, uh, it's about 27, almost 2,800 hours. Um, you have to keep track of it. There's a build log requirement. And at the end of the build, when the, uh, an inspection occurs, that is performed by a DAR, which is a Designated Airworthiness Representative. They're, they're commissioned by the FAA, but not direct employees of the FAA. Typically very experienced builders, long history of both uh, A&P experience as well as building. And, uh, and then one of the things they look at is, is your build log. And, uh, uh, and with that, uh, additionally, the, the, because I built this airplane, I have my repairman certificate, which means I can do all of the operation on this with exception of an engine overhaul. I can do oil changes, maintenance, uh, brake changes, fuel system maintenance. I mean, it's literally, I can do it on this plane only. If I sell this, that person cannot. Uh, because they don't have that that repair room. So ultimately it allows me to do pretty much everything I need to. I'm about to actually take it down for its annual, uh, for its condition inspection here probably mid-April. Would you build another airplane? Uh, I certainly want to. Uh, both my kids were involved in this, in particular my son, and he he's itching to build a bush plane. Uh, totally different sort of use and configuration, but Good man. it facilitated a spark in him mm -hmm. uh, and an interest in um, the mechanics, the process, uh, and the, the feeling of accomplishment when you're done. In fact, every, every builder I've ever seen who's got photographs lifts up that first part that they're, they've finished, whether it's the rudder or the horizontal stab or the vertical stab. I mean, they, they just, there's so much pride in that. You, you completed something that ultimately is in the air and he loves to, he loves to talk about that. Now your power plant, obviously you got a lot of carbon fiber aesthetics. What'd you call this carbon fiber? I mean, this nose cone alone is what drew me to this. Yeah, so this is, this nose cone spinner uh, was, was built by Cato. Cato the Propellers is out of California and they make the printer, the uh, spinner and the prop. And uh, this is honeycomb carbon fiber. So it's authentic uh, carbon fiber. It weighs maybe eight ounces. Uh, it's exceptionally light, but exceptionally strong. There's a bulkhead that they've uh, molded in right about here, but it's hollow inside, it just caps it off. But that's one of the pieces that um, I did certainly didn't want to paint it because that honeycomb is just a spectacular um, uh, look. I mean, it, it's just a beautiful piece and they do such a great job with it. Power plant wise, what do you have under the hood? This is a an engine that comes from a, a aircraft engine company called Pinnacle Aircraft okay. Engines. And they're out of Silver Hill, Alabama. Um, and they do magnificent engines. It's it's kind of a small shop, but I like that because you get much better attention. Um, I, I originally had an engine in here by a large manufacturer that um, went, it, it went the way of the Dodo. Uh, after about 23 hours, I had to ground it. It was coming apart. And so ultimately I had to get a replacement engine, which this is the, the pinnacle. It's basically a, uh, an IO360, uh, superior parts, Lycoming, um, uh, basically a Lycoming clone, uh, but it is souped up. It's got high compression pistons, dual uh, PMAG electronic ignitions, counterweighted uh, hollow crankshaft. Um, it is a fixed pitch setup. However, I have designed this as well as the inside and all of the systems to be convertible if I ever wanted to go to a constant speed. Fascinating. Um, I, I built that into the design in anticipation down the road. I have always wanted a, a Kato prop. Get this guy one sec. Um, so horsepower wise, what do you think you're making? Yeah, so this engine, um, high compression and, and the setup that it is, it's around 205 horsepower. Um, so it's got quite a bit more in the same uh, footprint as an IO360. That's pretty good. Um, it's very peppy with this prop. Like I said, Cato makes an incredible prop. 
Uh, this one is a little bit um, bigger diameter by about two inches than their normal uh, RV prop. It's about 68 inches with a, a 74 inch pitch. And that combination with this engine is incredibly powerful. It gets up and goes, love it in the mountains. It'll climb like crazy. Um, fuel injected? This is fuel injected okay. uh, all the way around. Great uh, engine monitoring system. And, uh, I can lean it out, do um, very economical flight at you know 5.9 to 6.3 gallons an hour. That's impressive. On the top end, I can chug 12 gallons an hour. Cruise you can go either direction you want. Yep. Yep. Wow. Now, I mean, this paint job is probably one of the best paint jobs as far as RVs in general because you, you won an award at EAA. I did. Yes. Um, I was. Uh, <clears throat> I was very fortunate. Uh, I took it to Oshkosh last year, 2022, and won a bronze Lindy with it, which is a kit built champion award. Uh, it was not the grand champion, but it was very, very close. Um, this was painted by uh, an incredible company out of Gadsden, Alabama. Uh, it's a company called Evoke Aircraft Design. Uh, Jonathan McCormick uh, owns that, and their guys are the best in the world. I'd put them up against any. And the carbon fiber that you see that is uh, <coughs> built into a lot of the different areas. I wanted to tie the inside and the outside in together. These are all hand airbrushed. Each individual block is done one at a time. Uh, it takes about four hours a square foot to do all of that uh, layering, texturing, and, and so forth. And, uh, just art. It, it really is. You I almost mean, don't want to fly it. Uh, well, I don't fly low because <laughs> it, it, I, to get near birds is something that would just ruin my day. So, so, I mean, obviously the exterior on this is gorgeous. Let's check out your interior yeah. because to me that's probably another work of art in itself. So, this right here is probably my favorite part about this plane is this interior. I mean, we got diamond stitching that looks like something out of a Mercedes AMG. <laughs> Pretty close. And it, um, so this was a, a long process. Um, this center console I built myself. I knew I wanted a center console in the plane. Um, factory doesn't come with it. All the controls typically mount to the panel or sub panel. And then um, the fuel selector is typically down on the, uh, just forward of the spar, the main spar. I always knew that I wanted it. So I had to essentially build it out of cardboard, transpose that to sheet aluminum build the frame, build the rail system, incorporate the controls, incorporate the fuel system, the wiring. This was um, a little touch that we put in. This still doesn't open. You have to this. Uh, you have to rotate to open it. And For your then snacks or what? What's anything. That? I've got spare stuff in there. Um, what you'll notice is there's a 3D printed sleeve that I worked with a buddy who had a 3D printer. Wow. And we measured out the dimensions, the configuration of it, and then we molded a um, basically a, a he printed a 3D printed a sleeve and then we dropped it in and I, I adhesively attached it. So. Just little things like that. Um, <clears throat> as far as your instrumentation, what screen, what setup are you running? These are uh, dual uh, Dynon HDX sky views, uh, touch screens. Both of them are 10 inch touch screens. They are incredibly uh, versatile, very easy to read, even in direct sunlight. It's incredible how well you can read these. Uh, love to fly behind them. The amount of uh, information and data that you can get right at your fingertips is, is astounding. Weather data, live weather data, uh, traffic, um, communication information, radio airport and radio information, um, just about anything. Because I've got uh, ADSB in and out, uh, I can see traffic in real time. Uh, I can see um, just about anything you could ever want to see. Um, so I can have the traditional six pack setup. change all the configurations and, and whether I want to do the six pack or I want to do the side tapes I can do a full dedicated I can put uh, the engine band down at the bottom rather than over here you can do this in flight you can change it um, just so much versatility on what you want to see and how you want to how you like to get information depending on your background um, I do like the six pack even though it's digital yeah it's just I'm used to that um, yeah. 
I see that you uh, robbed a couple of F F-16s of their uh, control sticks. I did. I certainly did. This is something that... Uh, let me switch this back here. And, uh, Just talk about detail to the T. Your switch setups, I mean, your everything about this, you've uh, obviously taken no shortcuts in. Yeah, no, this was a, a process, this whole interior, you, I can't even count how many hours I would sit in here and just think about functionality. The way I designed the center console, I wanted my fuel, my fuel pump, uh, my mixture and my throttle all within inches. So you're not fumbling around in, in an emergency situation. It's all right there. You flip, turn. This is amazing. Well, this does have a smoke system. That's what that tank is right back there. That's a four and a half gallon smoke system. How long does that last? Uh, never timed the full use, but uh, continuous, it's probably about um, maybe four or five minutes. Not a long time. It, it pumps a lot. I, I, um, the control valve can control how much smoke you put in. I mean, obviously the Colorado flag, like that, that was a nice touch. That was, uh, it was something that we wanted to do. Um, I wanted to do a nod to the home state, born and raised Colorado. But the traditional Colorado flag clashed with the design that we wanted. Okay. Um, and so I worked with Jonathan, and, and this was kind of his creation. I, I gave him a lot of latitude on that to come up with something that was really unique. And he uh, he just knocked it out of the park. I mean, this, this piece that he put together, uh, still incorporating the colors and then tying in with the rest of it. It just was an amazing job they did. So... Could not have been happier with how that turned out. That flows really well. Well, gorgeous plane. Let's go see uh, what she's like in the air. Let's do it. Okay. We're gonna go with a warm start because we're still warm. Won't feel off, start her on. Clear prop. Tell you what, this motor sounds healthy. Very healthy. It's got a nice little growl. Yeah, there. this thing. Pump it up. So how's taxiing with this? You just do? Do you do S turns? I mean, what is the I can see over the nose, okay. um, so I can typically just keep it straight. I'll nudge it every now and then, use the rudder, rudder and brakes. I don't ride the brakes a lot, but this thing picks up quick, or, or digital. All your checklists are digital. So if you, these are, if I go back here, these are all of my um, checklists that I've got entered in, emergency checklists, flight information. You do these uh, on a computer, on an Excel spreadsheet, then you can upload them onto a thumb drive and then plug it in right here onto the data port, which is where all the updates go. Unbelievable. That's a pretty nice thing to have. They don't have all this chaos. In Very. The it, lap. it is so easy to update and change things, and I've, I've updated this many times based on... You know, what's happening and what um, the flow, like, you know, I had switches backwards and so I changed the flow. It, it takes literally seconds to, to update it and move things around. Everything is customizable. I can move this stuff around. I can shift all my setups. So let me go through the uh, checklist here. So what are you looking for speed-wise on rotating them with this? Um, because we're uh, full fuel and with you, um, I like to leave it on until I'm hitting it about 65. Um, it'll, it'll fly when it's darn well good and ready. Okay. I usually leave with one notch of flaps. That helps as well. So, all right, here we go. Traffic. There's the tail. Come on back. Traffic. There's our 65. Flaps up. Climbing through 90 knots. 
thousand, two thousand feet a minute climb right now. Fully fuel passengers, two thousand feet a minute. It's pegged. <laughs> That's not bad at all. We'll fly to the south. Flying with me, remove a zero. Yeah, anytime <laughs> I fly uh, low fuel um, and just solo, this thing is off the ground. Here, traffic comes one for three up above us. Join a left downwind runway one six. Here. Here, area traffic, RV 976, Bravo Bravo is departing the pattern to the southeast. The arrow down means his, his trend is going down, so it's showing me what his active um, trend is. In cruise speed right now, so you're what, 66% throttle? Uh, throttle back here, we're starting to climb up uh, temperature-wise. This is low temperature, so this looks really, really nice. Uh, right now we're doing 135 knot ground speed, true at about 133. We're going to pick up some speed. We're still climbing at 500 a minute. So once I level off, this thing just starts to cruise at about speed-wise. Uh, my speed ranges with this particular prop. My Econo Cruise is about 45 to 48 percent power, and I could do about 148 to 152 knots true. Okay. Um, when I bump it up to 55 percent power, I can do about 160 true. Uh, 60. 5%, I'm starting to push about 170 knots, and if I go full wide open throttle, I've got to be pretty careful because I can be passing through 180 knots pretty quick. Wow. That's quite fast. It is. It, it really gets up and goes. It's kind of a pain to hand fly over um, long distances, so I always fly with the autopilot, so one, one touch, track and auto, that's it on autopilot. One touch. So right now you're doing autopilot. So right now it's flying this altitude and this track or heading. And it will maintain 7,100 feet. It will maintain a heading of uh, 042. And I change that by doing the heading and the altitude. If you watch altitude, oops, I'm sure, yeah, seven. So, we, so, so let's say I'm going to go into that airspace at 7,000 feet, right? I'm at 71 is my current setting. So I'm going to dial that down to 68. No. It's going to descend for me at about 500 feet a minute. So it should hold about a 500 foot a minute climb, uh, a descent or climb if you set it, set it up. This blue line indicates when I'm going to hit that altitude, the target altitude. So you can see it coming back. So that tells me that I'm going to hit my target altitude of 6,800 before I get to that airspace, which is good because we don't want to hit it after if I need to get under. Up north of that's 8,000. So now I want to change heading. So you'll see. So right now I'm on the compass here. So you'll see the, if I change the track, you'll see it move left and right. Just like that. Just like that. So the other alternative is I go in here and I've got this hooked up. This is Wi-Fi, this system. So let's say that you and I are going to fly to uh, Johnson Creek Airport in Johnson Creek, or in uh, Yellow Pine, Idaho, which I'm going to do this summer. So I can hit this flight plan just like that. You see that right there? Yes. It says send the panel. There it flight goes. I just updated. I just updated it, and there's my flight plan entered all the way to Johnson Creek. And that'll take you on each. That'll fly the route for me. The whole all route. The way, all the way there. Now, I haven't initiated. All I've done is I've entered it in. If I want to initiate, I've got to come up here. And I have to do HSI and altitude. Now, it's going to go grab the HSI track, and it'll fly us at whatever altitude I designate. Wow. So, I just, I stick it with this, and then what I can do is I can come in here and... Now, speaking of al uh, altitude and autopilot and turbulence... What does this do, correction methods-wise, if you start getting in really rough turbulence? Does it have a cutoff? Does it? It does. Um, it will... Just make sure. Traffic. So she's telling me I got somebody about to enter within three miles, 700 feet low. So anybody within 1,000 feet, she tells me, uh, and you can see it pegged here on the screen. So there's this is plan view. This is off in front. So that, that tells me... Uh, where that traffic is. Any of these dots or bogeys, uh, it'll, it'll tell me where those are. Now, the other thing i got to be careful of here is Fort Collins airspace. I think I see him. Yep, so it's up there. 
So it's pretty much straight up. Yeah, it's up to the left, so we're okay. So if we go out to Greeley, so 8,000 foot, we're at 68. Everything's kosher. We're doing 42% power. We're doing 152 the transducer is, is calculating every tenth of a gallon that goes through it. So this, this, and this are very, very accurate. So you're talking about Lena Peak. It'll let you know when you're at the prime burn? Correct. So I can... There's a setting I can do it. I do it off the sound of the engine. Okay. So I will lean it past the top and get it up and over. And then right as I get it to, uh, this, this comes from my engine guy, the way that he, he highly recommends using this. Get it up and over to where the um, engine just starts to run rough and then you fix the rough, barely. That gets it right to the Lena Peak uh, using engine roughness. Okay. Um, I have, there is a setup in here uh, where I can um, use engine tools and I can go to lean, and this will give me a lean process up and down. It works pretty well, but I have found that they're almost consistent, um, and, and I could use either. Okay. So um, I don't need to use that. I just use the engine. And so right now you're doing about 5.9. Doing 5.9. We're doing about 135 knots uh, ground speed. 130 ground, 135 true. Um, you know, bumping it up just a little bit. Like I said, 45 to 48 gets me um, uh, to about 100, typically about 150 knots, 148 knots. Wow. And you were saying that, you know, I was flying earlier so it couldn't film, but you can switch the screen back and forth yep. by, by the touch of a button. Yep, I can swap it. So display and swap. Now everything goes to your side. Wow. So it's completely uh, duplicated screen. Um, everything is on there that goes back and forth. I can, I can, each one has its own backup battery. Uh, each one has its own bus. Uh, each one is getting its own uh, GPS information, its own ADHARS box. So everything in there is, um, is redundant. So if this screen craps out, not likely that this one would crap out because they're on totally different systems, uh, different backup batteries. So one thing that's not showing up on here, this is all of our topo. So anything yellow and red is basically from 500 foot and above, you know, starting at yellow on into red, which, which goes above. So if I were to climb, that would start changing to yellow and then ultimately to regular uh, terrain color. When uh, I am transitioning um, from place to place, um, I like to know what current live weather is doing. And so what I'll do is I'll go into menu and I'll hit uh, weather options and I can animate. So I can now zoom out. This will show me, this is down here in particular in Louisiana. Not only does it give me live uh, weather, but it shows me consistently where it's going, where that storm track is. So I can see it moving left to right, up, down, northwest, east, north, south, east, west. Wow. I used that obviously going to Oshkosh when I was flying it to get painted in Alabama. Uh, flown to Phoenix twice. Uh, I mean, it, it's this sort of information is, is pretty critical uh, because it does. It gives you a lot of um, very useful information. I, and I think what people realize when they think of an experimental or a home built airplane is like, oh, it'll have just the basic needs to fly. And I, I feel like the experimental world now has transitioned to where they almost offer more features than what you could get with you buy a new Cirrus. Undoubtedly. Um, the beauty behind experimental is exactly the name suggests is you don't have to you don't have to get permission. So what you want to do with your plane is up to you. Now yeah. you are responsible for it. You are the PIC, your pilot in command. Yep. So ultimately whatever you do with it, you have to answer to. That being said, Everything in this plane goes through a different process when it comes to usability. These are rated for experimental. And because that's the case, they don't have to go through the certification process by the FAA. And that is not only extremely time-consuming, it's extremely expensive. Yep. Um, Dynan has had the, more, the market cornered for many, many years. They're the 800-pound gorilla. We've seen Garmin back down into the experimental market. They did that in the last 
10, 12 years. They, they took a look at it and said, well, you know what, that, that's actually a pretty interesting market. Let's take a look at that. So the G3Xs, and they've got some other stuff out, fantastic equipment. I have had, I've never flown the G3X, but I have other RV friends who love it and fly out uh, behind it, speak very highly of it, but others who have flown both, and you're not going to go wrong either way. But, yes, the functionality, uh, software upgrades, support, um, Typically, it's a it's a lower price point than than what most people may if they're you know like a bonanza. You've got to go through certified process, certified instruments, a certified A and P. Everything is certified, certified. So this removes that. Um, so I can if I want to put a Subaru engine out front. If I want to put a um, a Blackhawk engine, a Dyna um, yeah. uh Rotax wouldn't do it, but you know, t technically you could. You can do anything you want out front. Wow. Landing wise, what speed do you aim for? Um, wait, is it, it's right traffic for three four, right? Left traffic. So you'd, I'd make a, a, a. Oh, got it. Okay. You know, left down one, even though you're making yep. a right. Air traffic helicopter one for three Alpha Papa is entering the runway at the uh, runway at the disused runway. Be taking off. Runway 164, right traffic. Just pointing that guy out. Yep. Here we are, traffic RV 976. Bravo is orbiting over the field. We'll be uh, descending and re entering left traffic for runway 34. Here we traffic. Here traffic helicopter 143 Alpha Papa is departing the pattern Leaving to the altitude. northwest. At 5,700. Air traffic 2168 Delta is on the departure leg, runway 34. We have X-ray Bravo in sight. Air traffic 733 X-ray Bravo, straight left crosswind 34. Air traffic. Air traffic 2168 Delta is departing the pattern right crosswind, heading to Metro. Y'all have a good day. Air traffic 733 Bravo, left downwind, 34. Air traffic. Air traffic. Thank you for taking me flying in your bird. You, you got it, a, brother man. You have an amazing airplane, and you put the blood, sweat, and tears have paid off by the sheer uh, design that you've done. I mean, the whole layout is just amazing. How well, flies. Thank you. How it looks. Look out, ladies. That's all I got to say with... <laughs> <laughs> it actually turns the guys' heads more. <laughs> <laughs> well. Like, sir, could you please stop licking the tail? 